Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. We're going to continue our study in the divided kingdom, especially the restoration after the exile. We're going to be in chapter 40 of the book of Isaiah. This is a very pivotal break in Isaiah. I need to talk about a brief historical background, if I could. As you know, Isaiah is a prophet of the 8th century, which means he lived during a completely different time from the Babylonian exile. But chapters 40 through 66 of the book of Isaiah seem to reflect this period of return from exile. Now, Isaiah has been... Oh, put under moderate criticism and being two or three Isaiahs, I personally hold to only one Isaiah. I have no problems with predictive prophecy. I think God showed this prophet uh, the glorious days ahead of restoration and forgiveness. And Isaiah had a message to the people of his day who were becoming so discouraged under the uh, yoke of Assyria. Uh, chapters 1 through 39 deal with the historical setting of Hezekiah, Assyria being the world empire. But it seems in chapters 40 through 66, the time again is many, many hundreds of years later. God's people have all been taken into exile now. And Isaiah says, it will be over. God does love you. Hang in there. So let's begin in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1. Comfort. O oh, comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem, and call her out that her warfare has ended, and her iniquity has been removed, and she has received the Lord's hand double for all her sins. We begin with double imperative, comfort, comfort. The word here could mean consolation. Uh, there is a root idea here of repentance. I think that fits very nicely with verses 3 through 6 that we'll talk about in a minute. God is saying, get your heart right. Uh, let me come and comfort you. Notice the use of the covenant terms, my people and your God. The word says here is an imperfect tense in uh, Hebrew that speaks of continuous action. This is God's message over and over and over again. Be comforted. Be comforted. Be comforted. Notice the next little uh, verse 2 where it says, by the way, this very same idea is found in uh, chapter 51, verse 1, and chapter 66, verse 1. Uh, let me read you chapter 66, verse 13, where it speaks of, As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you, and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. What a beautiful picture of God as mother. You know, we can't always put a sexual connotation on God. He is neither male nor female. In Isaiah 66, 13, he is female. In other words, it says, speak kindly to Jerusalem. This word, speak kindly, is a, a, a wooing term, a love term, a courting term. It's used in Ruth, chapter 2, verse 13, and Hosea, chapter 2, verse 14, of lovers speaking to one another. Here God is pictured as his people's husband. Uh, the same thing is reflected in the New Testament when the church is called the bride of Christ. The intimate relationship between God and his people is so uh, real and so intimate and so vibrant that it's related to the love between a man and a woman. Notice when the next part of verse 2 where it says, Call out to her, again, another imperative. Her warfare has ended. Really, this term should rather be translated her hard service has ended, that her iniquity has been removed. A better translation there would be the penalty of her iniquity has been accepted as paid off. Now, it's not that uh, because she has been punished that her punishment paid off her sin. No, God has led her into exile that she might turn back to him. So it's not accepted um, in a sense of payment but it's accepted in the sense of the purpose for which it was done being accomplished. And that was the nation of Israel would not be idolatrous anymore. Notice it says she has received the Lord's hand double for all her sins. It's not saying that God 
uh, socked it to her twice as hard as she deserved. This is the words of poetry, not of mathematics. Maybe a better translation would be ample for all her sins. We're dealing here with a concept of temporal judgment. There are several kinds of judgment. There is the natural result of sin that comes to everyone who sins. There is the eschatological judgment, or the last day, or the end of the world kind of judgment. And here we have the temporal judgment, that God acts in time with his own children to keep them from error. I think in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 5 through 11, speaks about that whom God loves, he disciplines. And here his children are going in the dangerous area. And God steps in and says, that's enough. That's all. And uh, I think you to see that in our lives, too, as God disciplines each one of us. In verse 3 begins a, a literary technique known as several voices. It doesn't say who the voices are. Uh, the voice, who is speaking, is not as important as the content of the voice. Now, the reason we are so interested in verses 3 down through 5 is this is the very message that John the Baptist came bringing. He said, I'm a voice of one calling in the wilderness. This is mentioned in Matthew 3, 3, Mark 1, 3, Luke 3, 4 through 6, John 1, 25. John calls himself a voice. And so here's the Old Testament equivalent of that. Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. Let the rough ground become plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And it's very important we see what's happening here. Why did God say he was coming from the wilderness? Some think this reflects uh, the, ex the exodus from Egypt. Personally, I think that's a little far out. What we have here in the book of Ezekiel, which of course is a much later prophet, in chapter 11, verses uh, 22 and 23, and also in chapter 43, 1 through 3, Ezekiel sees a vision of God's glory leaving the temple and leaving Jerusalem and moving off into the wilderness to the east. The picture there is, of course, that God was going with the exiles. Now we have a picture of God returning from the wilderness. Notice in verse 5 where it says the glory of the Lord. That's exactly what Ezekiel mentions in chapter 11 and chapter 43. So I think we, here we have God coming back from exile with his people. The word Lord here in verse 3 is very interesting. It's used in the New Testament for Jesus. Quite often the New Testament writers use Old Testament names for God, for Christ. It is a way of affirming the deity and equality of Jesus Christ with the God of the Old Testament. Now, I don't know if he's just talking about making a highway necessarily, for John the Baptist surely did not make roads. It is talking about the internal attitude of the people. It is speaking of repentance in symbolic form of preparation for God returning. So here we have repentance in the etymology of the word comfort in verse 1, and also repentance in the New Testament repeating of verses 3 through 5. Now. When it says all flesh will see it together, here we have the universal implication of the gospel that is so prevalent in the prophet Isaiah. He sees the universal extent of the reign of God that is the only God. A little phrase, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it, is the Hebrew concept of the spoken word. We see it uh, a little while later in verse 8 where it says the word of God stands forever. It's the idea that what God speaks is accomplished, that God's word does not return to him void, but accomplishes that which he purposed it to do. God has said it, it'll happen, is the way verse 5 is trying to state God's universal promise. Beginning in verse 6, another voice picks up now, and a voice says, call out, and a second voice answers, what shall I call out? And then here is the message that these voices are to speak to the children of Israel. All flesh is grass. And all its loveliness is like a flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower, flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. Now here we have an idea that man and all his power cannot thwart the purpose of God. Israel had been caught up in a power struggle between the great empires of her day, Assyria, Egypt, 
Babylon. But God's saying, look, I don't care how powerful men are. I don't care how intelligent men are. I don't care how pervasive their government. Man is as grass. It's the ideal of flesh in antithesis to spirit. Notice the word loveliness there. It's really the Hebrew word hesed that's often used for the covenant name for God. The root ideal of that is strength. All man's strength is like a flower. Man can simply not compare with God. Psalms 103, verses 15 through 18, parallel these uh, second voice very beautifully. You might want to look it up later. Notice what it says, the breath of the Lord. It is very hard to lock down this term for wind or breath or spirit. The Hebrew words are all the same. They reflect the active presence of God in his world. Notice verse 8 where it says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. How can God's people have faith in God when these disasters have fallen on them? I don't think you and I can understand what happened to the nation of Israel. It'd be like every church in our country was burned and every preacher killed, every Bible confiscated. Boy, we'd be uh, so despondent and dejected in thinking God has forgot us. That's exactly where the children of Israel were. They thought, God hadn't kept his word. God doesn't love us. I pray God doesn't hear. And so the prophet has come back to say, oh, yes, he does. Oh, yes, he will. And so the word of the Lord stands forever. How do we know we can trust God? We know we can trust God because God keeps his promises. When he says something, it always comes about. A beautiful parallel passage I want to read you is Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 11. Listen as to the Lord. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there without watering the earth, and making it bare and sprout, and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so my word which goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. When God purposes something, man has no power to thwart it. Now, verse 9 through 11 uh, is speaking of God's power and care. Notice what he says. Get yourselves up on the high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up and do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. Now, Mount Zion is a synonymous phrase for the city of Jerusalem. It is not synonymous with the temple. The temple is built on Mount Moriah. But Mount Zion is another mountain, another peak, inside the ancient city of Jerusalem. It's where David was buried. Now, Jerusalem, of course, is the beautiful city of God. Notice it says to the cities of Judah, those who say that Isaiah didn't write this, and it was written by a person who experienced the exile, have a hard time explaining how someone who experienced the exile and saw the destruction of all the cities of Judah can say, say to the cities of Judah. I think it's a beautiful reflection that Isaiah is the author of this last section. Notice what a little phrase, do not fear. How often in the last few weeks we have come to the place where God has said to man, do not fear. I'm in control. Trust me. I can handle it. Here is your God. That's what Israel has been missing. They miss the sense of God's presence with them. And here God has returned. Notice in verse 10. Behold the Lord God. Now your English translation has the word Lord and God there. In Hebrew, it's Lord, Lord. It's Adonai Yahweh. Now Adonai means master or Lord or husband. And God, translated here in English, is the covenant name for God, Yahweh. But it sounds funny to have Lord, Lord, so they usually change it in the English translation to the Lord God. It speaks of his mighty arm. Whenever that's used in the Bible of God, it speaks of power and authority. Notice verse 11. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. Notice the picture of God as all-powerful and mighty has just been presented. And now God is pictured, not as all-powerful, but as a shepherd who walks with his sheep, knows them personally, cares to them, tends to them, provides all their needs. 
A good parallel passages might be the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 34, verses 11 through 16. Look at the verbs there. God tends, God gathers, God carries, God gently leads. The God who is all-powerful is the God who cares for you. And now verses 12 through 26 is a reflection of God's power and wisdom and his indescribable and inscrutable plan for man. Before we get into this, let me listen to our announcer, Phil Crenshaw. We'll return in just a minute. I know you are enjoying the Bible study this week. If you have any questions or comments, please write Bob at the International Sunday School Lesson Incorporated, Post Office Box 2711, Lubbock, Texas, 79408. He answers every letter personally. Or if you would like the free weekly outline of the Bible study that Bob writes every week just for you, which includes Greek and Hebrew word studies, parallel scripture passages, and the historical and grammatical background to the text, write to us at the International Sunday School Lesson Incorporated, Post Office Box 2711, Lubbock, that's spelled L-U-B-B-O-C-K, Lubbock, Texas, 79408. For those who contribute to this ministry during the month of July, we will send you a 90-minute cassette tape on chapters 4 and 5 of our verse-by-verse Bible study series on the book of the Revelation. These chapters are pivotal in understanding the purpose of the Revelation. I think you will really appreciate Bob's handling of this very difficult but important book. We would like to welcome KJAK FM 92, Lubbock, Texas, and Quad K FM 99, Odessa, Texas, and KVTT FM 91.7, Dallas, Texas. This is a new nationwide radio ministry. This ministry is solely supported by your gifts and free will offerings. We have no source of income but faithful supporters just like you who receive a blessing from this ministry and would like others to benefit also. Please continue to pray for us. And let your friends, neighbors, and Sunday school class know about this program. Don't wait. Get your pencil and write for the free weekly outline right now. The address again is the International Sunday School Lesson Incorporated, Post Office Box 2711, Lubbock, Texas, 79408. We so enjoy hearing from you. It is a great encouragement and confirmation of God's leadership. Now, here's Bob. Verses 12 through 26 reflect God as the almighty, ever-living, only creator God. Look at this verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens by the span and calculated the dust of the earth by measure and weighed the mountains in the balance and the hills in a pair of scales? These are questions, a series of questions to reflect the greatness of God. How much water can you hold in the palm of your hand? God holds all the oceans. How many of you can measure with your hand very much? The word span here is a word that means half a cubit. It is the distance from the tip of your little finger to your thumb when spread out. How long would it take you to measure the expanse of heaven? Notice here how the earth and the mountains are all part of God's creation. Verse 13. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or as as his counselor has informed him? Another question, speaking of creation, it seems to be a reference to Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. We're not speaking of the, the Spirit of God in a Trinitarian sense that is revealed in the New Testament completely. We're speaking of the Spirit of God in the Old Testament sense as that influence that goes out from God to accomplish his purpose, especially as it relates to the earth and the world. Now, notice in verse 14 where it says, With whom did he consult, and who gave him understanding, and who taught him in the paths of justice, and taught him knowledge? Here we have the idea again that reflect the historical background of the exile. God's people thought that God had not been fair to them, that he was not being just to them, that he was punishing them because of their parents' sin. They just didn't believe that God knew what he was doing. Here God says, Who's taught me justice? And who's taught me knowledge? I know what I'm doing. Hang in there. Trust me. Verse verse 15. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are regarded as a 
speck of dust on the scales. Behold, he lifts up the islands like fine dust. Now, it's very important that verse 15 relate down to verse 17. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaninglessness. Now, this is not saying God doesn't care for people. It's not saying God doesn't love his creation. It's saying in comparison to who God is, the nations of the world are insignificant. Now, think again of the powerful nations that have controlled the destinies of Israel, at least outwardly so. God is saying, I'm in control. My power is far more uh, significant than the puny power of man. Trust me, Israel. In verse 16, we have the idea of even Lebanon, which is a proverbial little phrase for beautiful forest of cedar. There's not enough wood in Lebanon, not enough beast in the forest to give an adequate sacrifice to who God is. Verse 18, To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare with him? Verse 25 is a restatement of this very thing. It is the Jewish way of saying there is only one God, monotheism. Who is like God? There are none others beside him. There is no one like this. There is one creator God, and he is the God of Israel, and he loves us. That's what it says, and what likeness will you compare him with? This goes back to the fact that God is spirit, and there is no physical image that can reflect who he is. That's why part of the Ten Commandments say you shall have no graven images. Man loves to make idols that he himself makes and set them up in worship. Verses 19 and 20 reflect that, that man makes his own idols. Isaiah 46, 5 through 7 is a good parallel. He makes them with his hands. He sets them up on a shelf, and then he controls them as he worships them. What a picture of man from the very beginning of the fall. Verse 21, Do you not know, have you not heard, has not been declared to you from the beginning, have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? Questions, bringing Israel back to what she had always been told and what had been revealed to her. Then in verse 22 through 24, we have the idea of God as creator again, who sits on the vault of the earth, the circle of the earth, speaking about the earth as if the heavens were a dome. Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches the heavens out like a curtain, who spreads them out like a tent. Now, the Egyptian book of the dead depicted heaven as an animal skin. The Rig Veda depicts heaven as a stretched animal hide. This is reflecting the fact that the stars are as if they are on animal skins and God opens and closes the animal skin. This is not scientific in any way in the world. It's simply description in the cultural idioms of the day. Notice verse 23. It is he who reduces rulers to nothing. The Jews need to hear that. Nebuchadnezzar is powerful. The Assyrian monarchs are powerful. Pharaoh is powerful. They're in the same league with God. Who makes the judges of the earth meaningless? Now, notice where in verse 25 he, he repeats the same theme. Who then is like me, that I should be his equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created the stars. Now, verse 26 must be seen in the background of Babylonian astral worship or astrology. They thought the the stars were deities that controlled the destinies of men. They sought the stars for uh, future omens about what they should do and not do. And that same junk is still with us today. You can't go in a grocery store without seeing horoscopes and read the newspaper and hear it on the radio. I want to tell you all that is pure baloney. Not only is it based on the Ptolemaian view of the universe, which is, has the planets going in circles, which is not true at all, but it is simply a way of trying to get around the, the only God's control of his universe. All of that is pure bunk. Notice God creates the stars, calls them by name. None of them is missing. There is no power in our universe that's not related to God. Notice verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and the justice due me escapes the notice of my God? This might be a reflection of Isaiah 49:14. Israel was really discouraged. 
She was in deep despair and problems. She did not know what to do. It seemed like every promise God had made, he had broke. They, they could not understand why God had allowed this to happen. Their life was a shambles, and they were blaming God. I know many of you feel like that sometimes, that you don't understand why your life goes the way it does, why things happen to you. We always tend to want to ask why and what if and maybe and could me and blame God for the circumstance that we find ourselves in. I want to say to you that biblical faith asserts that God is in control of his people's lives, that many times things happen in our lives that God allows to come because of our own evilness. Many times things happen in our lives that God allows to come that we might be more mature and more like Christ. But I want to tell you this. You've never prayed to God that he didn't hear you, and you've never had, had a problem that he's not concerned with, and you never cried at night that he wasn't with you. Believe. Believe what God is saying to them. Have, do you not know, have you not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired? His understanding is inscrutable. The word everlasting God and the word Lord here are related. The word Lord, of course, is the covenant name for God, Yahweh, the Hebrew verb to be. And so the everlasting and the ever-existing one are synonymous. Notice here the idea of weary or tired. God don't sleep. <laughs> You've never asked him to help. He's been on vacation. God is always alert to his children's need. Now, many times he doesn't change the circumstances we wish he did, but he's always with us to go through the circumstances. God doesn't act uh, hastily or lose his patience with us. This very lifestyle the children of Israel is reflected because of their evil. But God still loves them and has a plan for their life. Verse 29. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Reminds me of Jesus' call to every one of us when he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Lean on me, for I am meek and lowly at heart, and you will find rest unto your soul. The invitation for you to come to God is always open. In the midst of your problems, God is in control if you'll just open the eyes of faith. Look at verse 30. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly. Vigorous young men is a reference to men who are capable of military service. Though the youth stumble and fall. Listen what God will do for those who trust him. Yet those who wait for the Lord... The word wait here is a word that speaks of active trust, confidence, faith. Will gain new strength. The word here, will gain, is a word that means exchange their strength. Look at Psalms 103.5. Man cannot simply live in his own strength. We don't have the resources to meet all of life's needs and problems. God has to show us that we can't do it in our own strength that he can do it for us, that he might be lifted up. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and will not become weary. Friends, it seems like an anticlimax to us to have eagles flying, people running, and then walking. I think it's trying to say that God is able to give the strength needed for daily life. There's a beautiful little phrase I like so much that I think describes this aptly. Faith knocked off her feet finds that she has wings. And here are the people of God, crushed, defeated, their temple destroyed, in exile. And God says, trust me. Trust me. I'm working it out. It's for your good. Trust me. I think if God had a word to us today, he'd just say, fear not. Trust me. I'm in control. If you'll wait for me, have faith in me, I'll give you strength you never knew you had. I'll give you insight you never dreamed of. You'll fly where you used to crawl, and you'll run, and you'll not grow weary. What a tremendous message for our day. God bless you. I hope it sinks in deep to your heart. In Jesus' name.